All right, let me bring in my guest for this hour, trial attorney, Chris Melcher. Chris, thank you so much for being with me this evening. Thanks for having me, Michael. All right, it's three hours and 15 minutes. It's not a long time, but it is somewhat of a surprise. I think for me, I had predicted somewhere around three hours, having watched so many of these cases. Uh, love to get your thoughts on, A, do you feel like this is a little long for this particular case? And B, what could this jury be hung up on? Well, one, one thing I've been thinking about is this first degree versus second degree murder. And that um, I, I wish the prosecutor would have handled it a little bit differently in his closing argument, that for a first degree murder conviction, we have to show premeditated murder, some kind of planning, deliberate act. And um, but the prosecutor's also then saying that Christian Behera, Rivera was, uh, I'm sorry, Rivera was, was very upset and he was mad. He had been rebuked or rebuffed. And that's why he acted that way. And I wish that the prosecutor would have explained that this premeditation could only take a second under the law, that we don't have to um, show that there was uh, years of planning or, you know, detailed thought given to the murder, that the, the premeditation or deliberation could happen in an instant and also could happen even if you're angry. So that may be something that they're going through with the jury instructions, trying to understand exactly what that word means. Yeah, that's possible. I, there was something else he said that I found a bit curious. He, it almost seemed as if he was saying that you could um, impugn the motive from the way the crime was committed. The fact that she was stabbed so many times and the way it was done, that tells you about the anger, which then leads you to understand the motive. Um, you know, I, I question that approach as well. But here's what I think maybe, you know, I know when I think about this case, you take a look at this guy. Now, in Iowa, character of the person can be considered, which is interesting. I'd love to get your thoughts on that. But uh, first, I just want to say that, you know, you, you take into account who he is. He doesn't have much of a problem background. Uh, they claim to have that he has blackouts. But someone with blackouts, you think, might have some sort of criminal background or have fights or something. Very seems like a very peaceful guy. Then you have these two stories, okay? And neither one of them really seem to me to hold water. There seems to be problems with his confession to police. There's problems with the story he told on the stand. So I feel like maybe the jury is struggling with that aspect of this case. The fact that what do they do as a juror when they don't really believe either story? They don't have a real theory the state does as to how he actually killed her. They haven't really explained that. And I think that might be a place where they're struggling. It could. And, and this is what um, defense attorneys do. They swing for the fences and um, put as much doubt out there as possible uh, and hope just to get one jury kind of thinking about this kind of stuff. And, you know, could it have been the ex-boyfriend? Could it have been these two mysterious people? I mean, to me, it all seems pretty ridiculous. And um, but we just don't know how others are going to process their information. To me, um, the defendant testified that he took uh, Molly's body, who he said there may have been some movement initially when he opened the trunk, and he takes her body out and puts it in this cornfield. And of course, he's, his explanation is, is that he's concerned, uh, been threatened him and his family if he ever goes to the police. And even if that were true, I just wonder if any normal citizen would be able to take um, a lifeless or maybe even dying body of a young person who's must have really traumatic injuries and lots of blood and take that body out of the trunk and put it into a cornfield and cover it up simply because they're fearful of these other people. To me, somebody who could do that certainly could murder. And um, that that's the part that I, I wish the, the prosecutor would have focused a little bit more on uh, if there is any of this lingering doubt. Yeah, and then be quiet about it for five weeks. And who knows, you might still be quiet about it had they not seen his car going back and forth on that video. I agree with you there for sure. All right, Chris, stand by. We do have to take a break. Up next, we'll take you deeper inside the defense closing arguments in the killings of Molly Tibbetts' murder trial. So stay with us right here on Court TV.
Welcome back to Court TV Live. I'm Michael Ayala. We are still awaiting a verdict in the killing of Molly Tibbetts' murder trial. The jury has gone home for the day after deliberating for three hours and 15 minutes on whether Christian Bahena Rivera is guilty or not guilty of first-degree murder. Now, during the course of the case, the defense attempted to point the finger at other persons, both known and unknown, in the disappearance and murder of Molly Tibbetts. Bahena Rivera himself blamed two masked men. His attorneys blamed everyone from Tibbetts' boyfriend to nearby farmers with a history of abuse. So let's listen to some of the closing here as Fries explains to this jury that someone else had to do it because his client had no motive. Motive. Now, motive, Mr. Brown talked about. But you really have to use your common sense here, folks. You really got to think about this one. This man... This man, right here, five foot seven inch, 125 pound illegal immigrant, undocumented immigrant, gets angry at Molly Tibbetts, who he had never met before, who he was trying to get to know, if you believe that story, and resorts to killing her, stabbing her nine times. Or maybe 12, three more times? Because he's angry? The only evidence they have of his anger is the story he gave Pamela Romero. The evidence we do have about Christian Bahena is that he's not an angry man, that he's not violent, that he's a family man, he's hardworking. He came to this country for a reason. And you can bet he wanted to stay in this country. And the concept that he got angry and killed a woman who he had just met defies any logic. Folks, we've all been rejected in our lives. We've all perhaps have walked up to someone had the courage to ask them on a date or had the courage to try to get to know someone and been told no. May have been told no in an epic way. Been embarrassed by that person. You, common sense tells you that you aren't going to just stab that person. Let alone a person like Molly Tibbetts. It makes no sense. They have no motive as to why this man would commit that act. And then they have no scientific evidence that connects him to the killing. They want to talk about the trunk. They want to talk about the cornfield, both of which we admit. But having her in the trunk and putting her in the cornfield does not mean he killed her. Think about that. The burden of proof is on the state to, to, to prove all that. And that, folks, when you look at what's missing, is a reasonable doubt. What is a reasonable doubt? reasonable doubt, long and short of it is, the judge will tell you that if after a fair and full consideration of all the evidence, or lack, lack of evidence, okay, if they don't produce the evidence, that's just like evidence you can consider. Lack of evidence produced by the state. Mr. Bahena doesn't have to produce anything. He doesn't have to tell the state anything when he has the opportunity. He doesn't have to, when he's questioned, tell the state about these two masked men. It's not his obligation. It's their obligation to prove it. Don't let him shift anything. Don't let him oversimplify and make it sound like he has to do anything. Their burden. You have to be firmly convinced 
of his guilt as to each and every element. All four in order to convict him. If not, you must find him not guilty. Now, what does firmly convinced mean? Good question. You're not going to find anywhere in those instructions where it's defined what firmly convinced means. You have to determine for yourself what that means. I would suggest to you that in your deliberations, to be firmly convinced, you're going to need to know that Christian Behena did this. You can't just think he did this. You must know that based upon the evidence that they have produced, that he killed Molly Tibbetts, that he committed this crime, and that the state has proven these elements, you best know. You best not think. That's the difference between whether or not you're firmly convinced. Still with me is trial attorney Chris Melcher. And Chris, I thought the defense went the right way. I mean, in terms of the strength of where their case lied, it was the fact that there wasn't any real theory as to uh, how he actually killed her. Um, when he killed her, they didn't really have any evidence connecting him to the actual murder. And the fact that, you know, he is a guy who had no motive here. The motive always sounded a bit dubious to me. Love to get your thoughts on how they did with their closing argument. It was the best that they could do. Um, but ultimately, no murder makes sense. And so every, every closing argument by the defense could have the same thing. Why would anybody do this? Well, we keep seeing these murders. So obviously, uh, not everyone is like us. And uh, that we do see people getting angry and killing other people senselessly doesn't mean that uh, there aren't these evil folks out there. So I thought that there they were a little bit mixed in some of the messages they were talking about. Well, he's only 125 pounds, but well, this murder happened with a knife and you don't need to be that big to kill somebody with a knife. And then also um, commenting that he was an undocumented alien or immigrant with uh, didn't speak the language, didn't have any contacts here. Um, well, that, that could also go to potentially a reason why he wanted to kill her, because uh, uh, I think there was some evidence that she had said that she was going to call the police or something like that uh, uh, when he was approaching her. Uh, at least that was a theory. So, um, you know, I, like I say, it's the defense was kind of left some bad cards here with with the evidence that he directed the police to her body and had the DNA uh, of her in his trunk. So uh, not that much else they could do with it. But I think with what they had, they did the best they could. You know, a couple of things that they did, I think, were a little bit questionable. This the whole Dalton Jack aspect of their case, trying to point the finger at him. Um, they never did it specifically, but certainly uh, a lot of the questioning on cross-examination when they called him as a witness and even the story that was told by the Hannah Rivera seemed to point to them. And I'm wondering... As I watched him stand there in front of that jury trying to convince them that his client was not guilty of this crime, I'm wondering if that Dalton Jack attempt affected his credibility with the jury. Because the credibility with the jury as a defense attorney or even as a prosecuting attorney is so very important. It, it is. And, and that's the, the messenger there. And we have to maintain credibility so that the jury will listen to us. And I understand that they're trying to implicate uh, Dalton Jack there uh, as a potential suspect uh, or at least to show reasonable doubt that the police didn't sufficiently exclude him. This uh, has always bothered me because these witnesses, uh, like Mr. Jack, have no say in the case. They can't defend themselves. They can't sue uh, for being defamed, uh, basically being accused of something that they didn't commit. And it's very convenient for the defense to do this. Um, and, and basically, we've seen in many cases where, where this finger of guilt has been pointed uh, at people to try and get the guilty party off. And I think that that could backfire. The other thing that um, the defense said in the closing was correct in most cases, that the, the prosecution has to prove everything. And I get all that by beyond a reasonable doubt. But here... Um, the defendant took the stand. We rarely see that in a, in a murder trial. And so the, the jury has the right to disbelieve his testimony. 
prosecution doesn't have to prove that the the defendant's own testimony was right. The defendant uh, has to be credible. And if he's not, the jury can infer then from his lack of credibility in his story that he's guilty. Yeah, no question. And I think once they take the stand, it actually shifts the burden to the defense to show that what the story that he's telling was actually true. All right, Chris Melcher, I want to thank you so much for being with us this evening. We're going to let you go. Thank you so much. Hopefully you'll come back and join us again. Right now, we're going to switch gears to the Jinx murder trial when we come back. We'll take you inside today's testimony about millionaire Robert Durst and the continued abuse of his wife. We've heard lots of testimony about it, even more today. So stay right where it is. 